A few weeks ago, I was scrolling through Facebook when I ran into a video titled Famous Christians Deconverting, in which a Martin Isles of the Australian Christian Lobby discusses the recent trend of high-profile Christians leaving the faith. And while I usually let Christian media scroll by without comment, posts where Christians talk to other Christians about non-believers usually grab my attention. So I powered through all 24 minutes of this video and discovered that, no surprise, Isles says a lot about the motivation and mindset of these former believers, which is something he might have been better off asking them about instead. And also, no surprise, most of what he says can be mildly characterized as... uh... less than charitable. So I thought it would be worth taking some time to deconstruct how he talks about these former Christians, and to discuss the effect his message has on the conversation between believers and non-believers. And since it's best to let people speak for themselves when possible, I reached out to one of the subjects of Martin's video, John Steingard, and asked him to offer some of his own insights. So hello, John, and thanks for joining us. What's up, everybody? I'm John, and uh, thank you, Prophet of Zod, my new friend uh, who we have met on the internet. Uh, thank you for inviting me on to answer a few questions about some of these really important issues. Um, I hope I can contribute something meaningful to the whole discussion, and that's what I'm going to try and do. And I appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts. John was part of a Christian band called Hawk Nelson and has very recently experienced doubts about his faith and a recent high-profile deconversion. So I look forward to getting feedback from him about how he and others were portrayed in this video. Were they just knowingly rejecting God? Did they decide their way was better than his way? Were they driven by pride and a desire to sin? Or were there maybe other, more sincere motivations for why they left the Christian faith? Quick hint, it's going to be the last one. But join me as we break down Martin Isles' take on Famous Christians Deconverting. Okay, third topic of the day. I'm going to deal with something a little more substantial, a little more in-depth. It demands bit more attention. And it is this subject of deconversions, which seems to be the modern term for apostasy, uh, as with a lot of modern things that gets a little bit uh, mellowed, a little bit smoothed over. Why is apostasy a better word than deconversion? And why is the idea something that has to be mellowed or smoothed over? Already, Martin seems to be signaling to Christians that leaving the faith is not only negative, but so negative that describing it in neutral terms is euphemistic. From the start, deliberately or not, He's setting the tone for how his viewers should perceive former Christians. But it is the fact that I have been observing now on social media uh, a range of very high profile deconversions, people leaving, renouncing their Christian faith and doing so extremely publicly. August 2019 was former Hillsong worship leader from Australia, Marty Sampson. July 2019 was acclaimed Christian author of I Kiss Dating Goodbye and other books, Joshua Harris, along with his wife, Shannon. In February 2020, a massive US, those massive, uh, the massive US social media personalities Link and Rhett, for those who know them, others might know them through the What's in the Bible series as the Bentley Brothers. Uh, March 2018, former US-based Christian band Under Oath. Uh, May 2020, Canadian Christian singer John Steingard. And there's been others. There's some musicians, Michael and Lisa Gungor, I think that's how you say it, US Minister Bart Campolo, and others. The thing about the names that I've mentioned is not just that they're quite high profile, and especially a few of them there, uh, like Josh Harris, but the very, very public nature of their renouncing of their faith and the commitment that they had to their faith before that time. They were all involved deeply in church stuff, they were Christian musicians, Christian authors, uh, missionaries in the case of Lincoln, Rhett, and so on. And in most cases, this played out so publicly on social media platforms in very great detail that I'm sure it did quite a lot of damage. Here we have more of what I would consider unconstructive, loaded language. Now, to be fair, I can understand why it would seem like these deconversions did what a Christian would see as damage. As sure as stories of high-profile atheists becoming Christians can bolster faith, the idea of high-profile Christians leaving the faith can tap into insecurities and introduce a lot of questions. If a relationship with Christ is so real, why would a devoted follower leave? If God's existence is so obvious, how can someone go from true belief to true disbelief? And does this mean I, or someone I love, might start to experience similar doubts? But this is only damaging given the assumption that your religion is true and it's inherently good for people to remain in it. 
and while it's within your rights to hold to this assumption, you need to be able to step out of it, at least hypothetically, to get a broader understanding of the phenomenon and have constructive conversations with others about it. I can't say it's malicious, or even inarguably bad of Martin to start this way, but one way or the other, he's torpedoing any chance his audience will approach these deconversion stories with an open mind. Uh, in the case of Link and Red, it actually played out through hours of podcast material where they talked about it. And I've read what they wrote, uh, all these people, and I've uh, considered it all very carefully. They're very sad stories. They're stories of doubt, which leads ultimately to outright rejection. Um, now, I don't have the, in the luxury of interviewing these guys, but I can only read what they've said, read it carefully and reply. And what they've said, I think they've said very, very publicly and on intentionally publicly, so I'm comfortable that the public response is appropriate. So far, this has been a very well-measured, well-structured introduction, accumulating here where he sets the terms of what he plans to do in this video. Basically, he's going to give his own personal thoughts on high-profile Christians who have left the faith. Since they did so publicly, he feels justified in addressing it publicly, which is fair. And since he doesn't have the chance to interview them, all he can do is offer his own personal insights, which might be fair too. But if they're not available, is there any point in speculating on their motivations instead of asking them? Maybe, I guess. And I can see the appeal or even utility in Christians rallying together in an attempt to process something so huge. But it's at best inherently tricky, being rife with potential for misunderstanding or even disrespect, and no matter how Martin goes about it, it's clear he's stepping out onto some pretty thin ice. And I'm going to focus on the most recent four, that is Steingard, Harris, Lincoln Rett, I'll deal with together, and Samson. When I did read and listen to those stories, something struck me. It struck me that each story sounded remarkably alike. There's a great deal of overlap. Same themes continually surfaced, and they wrote lots and lots about, about their situation. And let me run through stuff that came through continually. First, they all said that they rejected the idea of judgment, that God, as a God of justice who judges, that was a key point of contention. That was described as harsh, unloving, judgmental, and unreasonable. Okay, so that was the first point. This is a bit tricky for a variety of reasons. First off, we're dealing with a communication barrier, as there are a lot of questions about what's called God's judgment that sound very sensible from the outside, but for a variety of reasons land differently on the ears of many believers. But I want to focus on a more immediate problem, that of Martin's phrasing. He says that these deconverts rejected the very idea of judgment, which is a suspiciously sweeping choice of words. Because judgment can refer to a variety of things, some more positive ones including personal discretion and the dealing of judicial consequences, and we can often associate it with the idea of justice. Thus rejecting judgment can sound problematic if you're not clear about what you mean. And to see why, it will help to skip forward to where Martin cashes in on this suggestion later in the video. You know, we also do know that evil will be ended. You know, the atheist doesn't know that Hitler will be judged, for example doesn't know that the wife basher will face justice, doesn't know that the criminal who kills their family member is somebody who will, who will face God, who will give an answer, who will give an account, because they will. Uh, and that's a great thing. Justice is, a, these people, they rejected justice. They said God is judgmental and that's horrible. No, it's not. It's the greatest thing in the world. So John, I'm curious, to what extent do you reject God's judgment and what does this mean to you? So when sort of thinking about the Christian uh, notion of judgment and what we read in the Bible and um, what we talk about in sort of Christian culture as, as judgment being uh, essentially that evil finally gets dealt with by God. Um, and I've had, this, I've had this question asked to me a few different ways. Um, and one person asked me, you know, like, if there's people that are doing horrible things in the world, like, don't you wish for judgment on them eventually? Like, don't you wish for them to sort of receive judgment? Doesn't that seem good and fair to you? Um, and to, to that I sort of respond, like, I, I recognize the seeds of, of horrible things in every single one of us, including myself. And so what, what I wish for when it comes to, you know, people doing horrible things, it, I, I wish for healing. Um, I wish for healing a lot more than I wish for judgment. I, I wish for healing for, for both the people that are 
uh, that are victims of, of horrible acts and also the perpetrators of horrible acts. Because I actually don't believe that, say, murderers, for instance, like I, I don't think that that's a good and healthy way to exist. And no, I know we could dive into my definition of good and where I'm getting that from. But you could even, you know, take Christian ideas of good and go like, do you think that um, that murderers are, you know, experiencing a life that, that you would want to experience, you know? Um, would you wish that life on someone that you cared about? And like, you, you certainly wouldn't. And so I, I sort of tend to look at it as people that are perpetrating horrible acts, whether they agree with it or not, they're actually doing something that's not in their best interest and it's not furthering their, their, their you know, their well-being. And so I wish for healing uh, when I think of these horrible acts, uh, you know, like Auschwitz and um, the Soviet gulags, like, more than judgment, I wish for healing for anyone that was touched by that in any way. Um, and I feel like that's a, a more integrated and, and complete idea of a response to suffering. Um, and that's what I would hope for. Very well said, and I agree. As much as we might instinctively feel evildoers should get theirs in the end, judgment carried out purely for the sake of retribution does nothing to set right their wrongs. And I think the exercise of eternal judgment is a valid aspect of God's character and of Christian doctrine to ask questions about. Now, even if apologists might find angles by which to pick at John's answer, it's at least too thoughtful and coherent to be brushed off as some form of rejection of God. Second, they all said that they rejected God's morality. Interestingly, especially emphasizing sexual issues. A common theme uh, was that God's moral standards, especially around sexuality, especially around purity and these sorts of things, but also uh, uh, women and men and gender and things like that, God's moral standards were harmful to people. It's telling that Martin says these deconverts reject God's idea of morality or think God's moral standards are harmful. This makes it sound like they are in opposition to things they know God's telling us when, hear me out, Maybe they aren't so sure God even exists, and they're questioning things people tell us God is saying. That's a pretty important difference, right? Yet Martin's choice of words skips right over it in a way that carries pretty heavy, you just want to sin connotations. Listen to Josh Harris. He says, I have lived in repentance for these past several years, repenting of my self-righteousness, my fear-based approach to life, the teaching of my books, my views on women in the church, and my approach to parenting, to name a few. But I specifically want to add to this to the list now, to the LGBTQ plus community, I want to say that I'm sorry for the views that I taught in my books and as a pastor regarding sexuality. I regret standing against marriage equality, for not affirming you in your place in the church, and for any ways that my writing and speaking contributed to a culture of exclusion and bigotry. So very strong words, and they're all quite strong on that point. If you're sincerely asking questions about God's existence, it seems reasonable to reassess whether you should have been taking a shit on the LGBTQ community and to feel apologetic if you had. And yes, calling it bigotry seems like an entirely appropriate response to homophobia. I mean, once you take unfounded assertions about the preference of an invisible being out of the picture, bigotry is about all that's left behind homophobia, right? And by the way, Imagine society telling you you can't be with someone you love, and suddenly you'll be very strong on that point, too. Weird how fundamentalism can make people talk about compassion like it's a problem. Now, thirdly, um, and especially in the case of Marty Sampson and, and, um, and Steingard, what was um, uh, John Steingard, um, uh, they objected to God's dealings with uh, the world. Um, and on the one hand, the fact that he allows suffering to occur the fact that he allows evil to exist. Uh, on the other one, um, that he does things in the Bible that seem unreasonable. So Steingard, for example, uh, attacks the stories of Job and Abraham, saying that God is unreasonable to those men. That was one example he gave. Uh, Marty Sampson said, for example, he, uh, why doesn't God cure cancer? Because he said, surely if I had the power, that's what I would do. So once more, we run into an issue of phrasing. Do these former Christians really object to the dealings of a God they more or less know exists? Or is it more likely that the problem of evil gives them reason to question whether the idea of this God is plausible to begin with? Being unclear about this point can do a lot to make Christians misunderstand non-believers. He also mentions that Steingard attacks the stories of Job and Abraham, which, again, phrasing. So, John, would you like to clarify what you meant by this? So, on this issue, I feel like, um, you know, my whole life as a Christian— 
reading the New Testament gives you a perception of, of God as a certain, you know, character of being. So, like, a loving father is, is a commonly used um, uh, metaphor for, for God's nature. And in the New Testament, you do get this very, um, the sense of a very loving, compassionate God. And, and of course, that's, that's an idea I gravitate to. That's an idea that permeates Christianity. And it, it's an idea that, that I think uh, is compelling and, and a reason why a lot of people put their faith in Christianity. Um, but if you take that same picture of who God is, and then you go back and read the Old Testament, there's some pretty horrifying things in there. I mean, Numbers 31 talks about uh, God, you know, permitting what appears to be sex slaves. Uh, Deuteronomy 20 tells uh, the Israelites specifically that if people that they fight against don't surrender, that you can take them uh, to do forced labor for you. Now, I don't know how you, you would interpret forced labor, but that to me sounds like slavery. So that's an example of a situation in which there's just, there's just moments in the Old Testament where God's nature seems incredibly different than it does in the New Testament. And if you're taking the person of Jesus and the picture of God the Father in the New Testament as the standard of God's character, then, you know, by that very idea, um, a lot of the stuff God seems to have commanded in the Old Testament seems pretty horrifying and wrong. So I don't think it's me that's taking... Uh, my own preferences as a pre- as a precedent. I think I'm looking at the New Testament, which I did my whole life as a Christian. I'm formulating an idea of who God might be based on that, and then I'm looking at the Old Testament, and it doesn't make sense, and it, it's sort of horrifying to me that God would command some of the things that he did, and it makes far more sense to me that that the Old Testament was written by people who were trying to understand their experiences, and they, they used... W- descriptions of God or, 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 or concepts of God that seemed to fit in with their life. And uh, their lives were very, very hard. And uh, it does seem to me that some of the things that went on at that time, they may be justified by saying God commanded them. And that seems to make more sense to me than trying to take this picture of the New Testament God and apply it to the Old Testament and have it make sense in some congruent way. Those are great points. And even if a fundamentalist Christian may not agree with what he said, it's apparent at least to me that he's honestly trying to process what appears to be conflicting representations of God across a body of literature. And he's doing so in a way that's extremely charitable to the Old Testament authors. To sum this up by saying John's attacking stories from the Bible is to miss his point entirely. And in fact, I'd go so far as to say it's encouraging people not to see his point. We ask these kinds of questions about countless literary traditions. So why is it an attack if we do the same with the Bible? If you can't get your head around this idea, I have to question whether you're prepared to understand any mindset that lies outside your immediate fundamentalist circle, much less to give an informed dissertation on where non-believers are coming from. Now those are three objections. They are objections to God as he has revealed himself. They are objections which say that he's not good enough, that he's that his justice is flawed, that his actions are questionable, that he allows things to happen which are unfair. Again, very loaded language. Objections to God as he has revealed himself? Um, how exactly has God revealed himself? Whether he's revealed himself, and whether there's good reason to believe in him at all, is the core point, right? When people ask whether he's good enough or his actions are unfair, They're asking questions about a literary character to help illuminate whether it's even plausible that it could be a real-life being. So when Martin says they're objecting to God as he's revealed himself, he's explicitly skipping to the end of a conversation that should be about belief and jumping right into a conversation about obedience. And Samson's comment is this, I'm struggling with parts of the belief system that seems so incoherent with common human morality. And you see, at this point, there's a turning point, um, common human morality. He starts to go away from God to the human perspective, uh, a focus away from God to human foundations. Again, and I'm starting to feel like a broken record, maybe this isn't an issue of rejecting God's morality in favor of human morality. Maybe it's rejecting badly justified human morality in favor of better thought out human morality. Maybe when someone just comes up to you and says, God speaks to me and here's what he wants you to do, 
it's healthy to question whether this is true. And maybe your spidey senses should get extra tingly when that person responds to your questions by accusing you of turning away from God and toward mere human morality. And that comes through in all of their stories, especially though in this way. They do confess ultimately that they decided to do it their way. And that's the fourth point. For Samson, Muddy Samson, he said, I live, I live by my heart and it hasn't failed me yet. Lincoln Rett said that this was the harrowing adventure that is self-discovery. Shannon Harris, Josh Harris's wife, referred to learning to listen to my inner voice. So they went their way. Here Martin comes close to a core truth, which is that while your inner voice can give you a good starting point for conceptualizing morality, it needs to be kept in check by outside information. Otherwise, your instincts and emotions might lead you astray. However, this isn't news to non-believers, which is why we look around and try to understand how our actions affect others. To dismiss this as following your heart can make a very thoughtful, evidence-based process seem shallow and self-centered. It might be that learning to follow their hearts is just one part of these deconverts' process and they are leaning heavily on outside advice and other feedback as they rebuild their understanding of morality. Or maybe some are leaning too heavily on personal intuition and they still have room to grow in their understanding of what it means to be moral outside the faith. Who knows? Either way, I see value in developing a purer understanding of an inner voice that religion had taught you to misunderstand. And in fact, I think it can be reasonably argued that when people base their morality on the part of their ego they call God, instead of on the consequences of their actions, they're the ones relying too heavily on answers they find in their own hearts. But that's a lot to dig up here. But fifthly, they acknowledge that actually in doing so, they didn't find their answers. Their questions are still unanswered. They've walked away from Christianity, but not into anything else. Link and Rhett, for example, I jumped into, and I deal with these guys together, but I think it's Rhett that said this, I jumped into a sea of uncertainty, and that's where I've lived for about six years. Okay, hear me out. Maybe it's a good thing they haven't settled on quick, easy answers yet. Maybe the answers of Christianity are built on a false sense of certainty and conclusions people have just jumped to, and maybe it's not great to replace one false sense of certainty with another. Maybe, as with science, being willing to say, I don't know, is better than guessing. And maybe, if they don't have answers now, these deconverts will gradually arrive at better thought out answers, and a better sense of how certain they should or shouldn't be in those answers, if they give things time. Now, sixthly, it's interesting to observe that there have been consequences of these change belief systems. You know, what we believe affects how we live. Surprise, surprise. Both Marty Sampson and Josh Harris, they've divorced their wives. They've had family breakdown. Okay, so it's easy to say, aha, these people left the faith and then got divorced, so therefore leaving the faith has consequences. But this is an extremely superficial take on the situation. It's possible that these marriages were never as healthy as they looked. And in fact, religious doctrine may have undermined them with a body of weird, artificial expectations. For some, the true story of these relationships may have been one of unnecessary confusion and frustration hidden behind the facade of a good Christian family that was only maintained for the sake of career and social obligations. And maybe once the reason to maintain this facade was removed, the marriage appeared to suddenly fall apart when actually its rotting core was just finally being exposed. Of course, we don't necessarily know this is the case, but there are a lot of realistic possibilities. And just as it might be presumptuous for me to look in from the outside and make one of these assumptions about these divorces, it's equally presumptuous for Martin to just assume these were healthy family situations that suddenly went bad as soon as he left the faith and use them as examples of the consequences of disbelief. And this is even ignoring the fact that these are just isolated stories, because I know a lot of Christians who fly through multiple train wreck marriages and a lot of atheists in long, stable marriages. Lincoln Rett said that they took their families with them on their journey away from faith. How is this a consequence? Isn't calling a change from one side to the other in and of itself a consequence totally circular? Essentially, Martin's saying that being an atheist is bad because it has consequences because it causes people to become atheists, which is bad. Uh, Josh Harris said that he'd been living in unrepentant sin. I don't know what exactly he didn't say. Is unrepentant sin necessarily bad? Maybe. But maybe only as a violation of arbitrary church doctrine. And while this may seem important to those within fundamentalist Christianity, maybe they would do well to introspect on why it's important to them. 
Maybe if they want to get a sense of how to talk to other people, they should think of what their idea of sin looks like from the outside, whether it means or even should mean anything to a non-Christian, and whether non-Christians who sin are sometimes just doing the best they can in life, but just aren't following specific codes from within Christian scripture, just as Christians don't follow all the specific codes of every other religion in the world. Christians don't have to agree with all these people, though their disagreement doesn't seem based on anything demonstrably important, at least as far as I can tell, but they should at least develop the ability to recognize that many are making a sincere and intelligent attempt at doing the right thing, and thus not to approach them all with the assumption that they're choosing sin over righteousness. Of course, Christians have the right to think that their doctrine represents the absolute standard of right and wrong behavior and to speak to others accordingly. They just shouldn't find it surprising when this inhibits respectful conversation between them and others. In Harris's case, the fact that Martin doesn't even say what the sin is gives plenty of room for speculation about how consequential this is or what it even means about the story of his deconversion. Finally, it's interesting, just one more interesting point, which uh, I just add as a footnote, but it comes up in my, my dealing with the issue later. Um, Samson and Steingard ask God, ask why doesn't God show up? So Samson says he's ready for Jesus to show up and tell him he's real. Uh, John Steingard says, my prayer in recent days has been, God, if you're there, please show up. I mean it sincerely. So far, I don't feel like I've been answered. My door remains open. And this is um, to depart from objectivity for a minute, but basically that's saying, I've decided I don't like God's way, so please do it my way, show up. Is this really demanding that God do things your way? Or is it just expecting humans who tell you there's a God to show you evidence before you'll take them seriously? And in amongst all of these things, there's a thread that the Bible's not reliable, it's fallible, uh, and also the theme that their deconversions began with doubt, and they entertained the doubt, and it slowly unraveled everything that they believed. <laughs> So, the question arises at this point, how to respond? Firstly, obviously, carefully. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm limited by time, so I'll cover a few bases reasonably quickly. But I want to just traverse a bit of a, a trajectory in what I say, because uh, I, I want to I hit a few things here. Notice, as I said, that the earlier points, those first three points, are effectively rejections of God as he has revealed himself. He's not good and his ways are not good, right? Rejecting his morality and his actions. His dealings with human beings are harmful and hold us back. Uh, he does not sufficiently explain or give account of himself. And you know, there's an underlying assumption there that comes out sometimes that I'd do it better. Again, as I've already explained, the question of whether God's revealed himself or not is the point of this entire conversation. If a person doesn't believe, they probably haven't seen a clear revelation of God and insisting they have then berating them for rejecting him isn't super duper constructive. Um, and I think, you know, the most important thing here in response to this firstly is a perspective shift. Without answering a specific question, but making a perspective shift. You know, I realized as I read through this that this is one of the classic problems of human beings, that fundamentally we always struggle with our station as creatures. Those that are, as Genesis says, of the dust, finite, limited, actually quite ignorant despite what we think of ourselves, subordinate. I mean, we don't even understand the world. We're investigating it. For, we don't even understand the bottom of the oceans. We're still looking. Um, that's who we are. We're subject to greater powers which we cannot control and which we do not fully understand. And you know, that was the simple problem in the garden, was the same struggle in the Garden of Eden. Um, what was the promise? You shall be as gods, came the voice of the servant. The serpent. Um, how so? Well, God's held something back. He's held back some secret, some good thing. God is not good. Is it really the case that he said that? Or did he just say that because he knows you will be as gods and he doesn't want it for you? He's holding back some good thing. Is his word really reliable? Or do you know better? Indeed, maybe your way is more fulfilling. And as you read these stories, it's really sad. You can hear the voice, that old voice of the serpent saying, has God really said? And it's interesting to me that for a book which is so roundly criticized as unreliable, fanciful, and irrelevant by each of these deconverters, it surely explains our spiritual condition pretty well. And it surely gives insights into what's going on in their lives 
pretty well. It diagnoses the human condition brilliantly. And by the way, I didn't craft this. I just wrote out what they were saying and I started to think, and here we are. Maybe the Bible explains our state pretty well, but then maybe its description of human shortcomings is more mundane than you realize. Maybe it leans a little too hard on the imprecise intuition of its ancient authors and, while these authors aren't stupid, maybe centuries of moral philosophy, psychology, and social development have since given us a more detailed and reliable picture of human nature. And while some of the Bible's insights might still ring true, maybe the same can be said for almost any other body of ancient literature, and maybe your estimation of the Bible's roughly hewn insights is inflated by excessive familiarity. Maybe this familiarity sets off a circular process in your head, in which you've spent so much time hearing the Bible say we're in a fallen state of rebellion against God that the idea has defined your view of the human condition. So when you go back to the Bible, you're amazed that it does an uncanny job of describing a narrative you didn't realize it had placed in your head to begin with. In other words, you're just shocked by how well it repeats what it had already told you. Now yes, these are all maybes. But after leaving the faith, I've started piecing together what at least appears to be a much more nuanced, insightful, and I dare say plausible picture of the nature and consequences of human shortcomings, just as these recent deconverts are probably doing. And while we might be wrong, I don't think we're so obviously wrong, and the Bible so obviously uniquely profound, that our criticisms of the book can be flippantly characterized as funny. And this is important, because once you've planted the suggestion that all human failings are a horrible affront to God born out of willful rebellion against him, you can then weaponize the idea against anybody who doubts your faith. And that's exactly what Martin does here. Notice that he doesn't only say this describes humans in general well. He says it describes what's going on when these people deconvert which immediately delegitimizes their doubt as nothing more than a form of rebellion on par with that of Adam and Eve. Now, of course, all he needs to do is bring up Romans 1 and... Now, Romans 1 then sketches out a pathway that people so often take. Having rejected God as he reveals himself and suppressed the truth about God to go on and live instead in the way of their choosing in unrighteousness, as the biblical language puts it. And, of course, there we have it. Now, yes, my video is scripted, so I knew this line was coming and timed my prediction accordingly. But did anybody really think Romans 1 wasn't going to come into this at some point? Because in this passage, Paul provides the classical biblical example of what Martin is doing, which is preemptively characterizing non-believers' motivations as wicked. They don't just legitimately doubt. They've seen God reveal himself to them, um, arguable, yet still want to do their own thing and live life their own way. This, of course, is nothing but a cult-like tactic that, consciously or not, is used to disparage former believers in the minds of current believers and ignore the possibility of sincere non-belief. The fact that Paul employs it in writings that ended up being canonized by the church doesn't mean we should take it any more seriously than when Martin does the same in a YouTube video. They then start to serve the self. They then start to do it their own way. And that was the next thing we saw in these deconversion stories. The I did it my way uh, attitude. Um, worship and serve creature rather than creator, says Romans 1.25, to serve the self. Is anybody really suggesting worshipping creatures? This seems like a false dilemma that offers two options. One, obey humans who claim to speak for God, or two, worship yourself. But maybe there's a third option which might be, I don't know, trying to figure out how to best interact with the people around you without worshipping anybody? This doesn't make you God. And in fact, done in a healthy way, it involves showing consideration to others and listening to the advice of those around you. The fact that you judge this advice on its merits and don't just automatically believe people who say they're passing on God's will doesn't mean you have an I did it my way attitude or that you worship creature over creator. And people who suggest it does just might be maneuvering you into an unhealthy level of trust in what they say God says. And then, having served the self, people then do as they please. They, the practice of their lives follows their desires because that's what's in the self. And Romans 1 makes a particular point that usually that manifests itself with moral breakdown of some kind. And uh, look, I see it's interesting here that these guys, and most of them, emphasize their objection to sexual purity. And in two cases, they divorced their wives. Belief, practice. Josh Harris has since been to pride parades and things like that. Belief and practice in accordance with the biblical sketch. So we already discussed his point about post-deconversion divorces. 
But it's interesting that he also cites support for the LGBTQ community because we're automatically supposed to assume it's a bad thing? Look, if you're a Christian, I understand you may think homosexuality is wrong, maybe even an act of rebellion against God or whatever. But you need to consider why you believe it's wrong. For most Christians, it's at least largely because a set of writings and or teachings tell you that a God who might or might not exist says it's wrong. This is a pretty tenuous premise to build your case on, and given that a person doesn't see evidence for God, might supporting people who just want to be themselves and live their lives without harming anybody else be considered a good thing? What's your take on this, John? So, if loving and supporting members of the LGBTQ community is a negative consequence, then sign me up, because I have friends that are gay, and um, I, I really care about them deeply, and, and I have a really hard time believing that their sexuality uh, somehow uh, separates them permanently from, from access to some divinity that I have access to because I'm straight. Like, that just doesn't make sense to me. And, and, and I also think that doctrines like the idea of conversion therapy have been horrifyingly, uh, you know, damaging to people that I know that have been through them. I, I know several people that have been through conversion therapy and not one of them has said, yeah, it was a good thing for me. <laughs> so I think Christianity as a, as a whole needs to deal with this issue of homosexuality differently. I, I think this whole love the sinner, hate the sin thing uh, sounds good if you're a Christian who's straight and doesn't have any uh, understanding of the, the difficulties of what it means to be gay and come out as gay. Um, but in, in reality, you know, if I'm, if I have something that's integral to, to who I believe that I am, and then someone tells me, you know, like, oh, I love you, but I hate that thing inside you. It's like, well, it's really going to be a hard for that person to feel love genuinely. And the other thing I think about this is that Christianity is basing its stance against homosexuality on, on a, a very small number of verses in the Bible. Um, and it lumps homosexuality in with a bunch of other sexual behaviors in a way that I feel like is not that difficult to make a case that they were not describing the type of homosexuality that we have in our culture today. I mean, I think like in, in biblical times, there was no, there was no version of same sex marriage that we have now where it's two consenting adults in a committed relationship. That just didn't exist back then. So when they're talking about homosexuality, they're talking about all kinds of other types of behavior. And then I also think there's a, there's a, a bit of picking and choosing going on here because there's other things, even in the New Testament, even if you throw out the Old Testament entirely, there's things in the New Testament that uh, you know modern Christians sort of need to deal with. Like First Timothy talks about not letting women teach. So if you're going to take the verses against homosexuality seriously, then you also need to take that seriously. There's also a verse in 1 Timothy that talks about women shouldn't braid their hair. And it's like, well, if you want to make the argument that that was a cultural thing, you could just as easily make the argument that the homosexual issue was a cultural thing too. My take on this whole thing is that while Christians will tend to say that you can't pick and choose on what things to believe in in the Bible— uh, I would say that pretty much every Christian already does exactly that. And as for standing against biblical teaching, I, I think my perception of what the Bible is has really evolved. As I've looked at a lot of the things in the Bible that are troubling, uh, stories that bother me, and uh, you know, things that that strike me as as fairly wrong and immoral that that God seemed to have commanded. And again. My sense of wrong and immoral is based on Christian values. That's how I grew up. I'm taking those very same Christian values and applying them to some of the things that, you know, that God is 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 apparently said in the Bible, and I'm I'm seeing a, a discontinuity there. And so, as my perception of what the Bible is has evolved, I've become a lot more inclined to pick and choose, and I, I will admit that I'm doing that. Um, I think that there are things in the Bible that are incredibly helpful and wise and, and good to apply to our lives, but I also think there's things in there that uh, are worth leaving behind, and um, I, I know that's not a, a, a typical Christian viewpoint, uh, so, so 
I had to sort of adjust my perception of, of how I view myself and how I view the Bible and um, recognize that my sense of morality is very rooted in Christian tradition. And I'm taking that same sense of morality and applying it back to the Bible and to Christian culture, and I'm noticing issues. That's a great articulation of why supporting the LGBTQ community is, you know, something other than an attitude problem that comes from rejecting God. Now look, I get this is tricky because it involves a point of contention based on the question of God's existence. But if you want to communicate with non-believers, you have to leave that question open enough, at least for the sake of conversation, to allow for the possibility that they're doing what they believe is right based on sincere lack of belief. Again, Scripture describes the human condition startlingly well. Could it be that it's actually realistic, practical, even revelatory? Scripture reveals this, God is great and we are not. God is creator and Lord of glory, we are creatures, we are dust. And the simple reality is this, you know, we rebel against that after that pattern I just described usually. We rebel against it and yet we are incapable of knowing all. We're not that wise, we're not that powerful, we're not that omniscient or that infinite or that great. It is not in us that all things consist. It's not by our counsel that all things were created, in which all things, by which all things are ordained. We weren't there when God laid the foundations of the universe. Look at our limits. Look at what we don't know. It orients us rightly. And this is kind of the point that God makes to Job when he goes and speaks to him at the end of his trials. Um, I mean, just as well, I can't even draw a decent picture of the chair I'm sitting on. <laughs> we're human. Um, and this is why the Apostle Paul orients us, gives us that perspective. He says, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. So let me get this straight. Martin's human frailings leave him so limited that he can't even draw a chair, yet somehow he's sharp enough to not only define which book of scripture was the word of the true God, but to interpret it so well that he can instruct other people on how this God wants them to behave? Now, yes, Martin never claims to understand the totality of God. And he does point out that he can't grasp, for example, the Trinity or where evil comes from. But it seems convenient that his ability to grasp God is fuzzy when he doesn't want to answer questions about his paradoxical nature, yet it suddenly comes into razor-sharp focus the moment he wants to tell people what God wants them to do. From here I'm going to rush past the rest of Martin's video, as the structure of the presentation loosens considerably, with Martin meandering through a long monologue about the power of faith and how there are mysteries we can't comprehend and so on including the nobody will judge Hitler without God's judgment thing we addressed earlier. But honestly, while you can watch this yourself later, he goes into some pretty long-winded sermon territory that doesn't give us much to work with. So I'm just going to skip to a few of the remaining points he makes. And this is what the atheist doesn't have. They not only don't have an answer for evil, they not only don't have an answer for suffering, they not only don't have an answer for so many of the things that we're talking about, they don't even have an answer for logic and reason and all these things because it's just a chemical reactions in the brain at the end of the day. I mean, what does it even mean? Yeah, I don't have time to go down the solipsistic presuppositionalism path today, so maybe we'll fast forward even further. But they also made this point. They said, where is God? Why doesn't God show up? And here's the thing. Both of those points are answered at the same time because he has shown up and in showing up, he has shown us that he is infinitely good. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And isn't that true? That's the God we've been talking about. And yet look at this, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has ever seen God, but the only Son who is from the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. What is God like? Who is He? The answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture speaks of God's glory, which is the declaration or setting forth of who He is. Seen in creation, that speaks of Him and His glory and who He is. We see it in His deeds, His works, that speaks of Him and who He is, but we see it most of all in Jesus Christ. The glory of God, the revelation of who He is in a person. Now wait. If someone asks why God doesn't show himself, telling you about how the Bible says he showed himself is not an answer. It's just reiterating the claim we're asking for evidence of. 
I mean, if I tell you I believe in three pigs who build houses, and you say you'll believe when they show themselves, I can't just say, well, they already show themselves in the tale of the three little pigs. That would be transparently circular nonsense. But it's literally what Martin is doing here with Jesus. And the fact that he does shows that he's speaking straight past non-believers to people who already take the truth of the Bible for granted and thus won't notice that he shifted from talking about verifiable revelations to telling us what the Bible says. By doing this, he blurs the line between Bible stories and obvious observed reality, which trains believers to think that anybody who denies Bible stories is denying obvious observed reality, in turn preparing them to be confused by and eventually frustrated with anybody who doesn't automatically believe the Bible. You can imagine this doesn't set up a lot of great conversations. And my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the possibility of that faith proves that he's good. Uh, what? And my faith is well placed in one who is totally trustworthy in his goodness for all time. And you know something? The resurrection really is the final piece of the puzzle because that is the historically reliable fact. It happened. The proof of the resurrection, which maybe I'll do on another day, is astonishing. And of course you have to tie things together by asserting that Jesus' resurrection is a reliable fact. Probably the typical stuff about how many times the church reproduced copies of the New Testament, or the fact that someone wrote down the claim that 500 eyewitnesses saw Jesus. If you've been around this channel long enough, you get the drill. But since all he does here is make an assertion before dropping the mic, I see no reason to engage. Anyway, this pretty much brings us to the end of Martin's video. I guess if I were to identify the biggest overarching problem with it, it would be that he assumes God said certain things, and then accuses non-believers of knowing God said those things, yet rejecting him. And Martin's not alone here, as far too many fundamentalists do the same. If they say God said something, God said it. It's not up for question, to the point that if you ask about parts that are contradictory or totally incoherent, they'll say you can't question God because he's infinite. I asked John about this, and he had some very fascinating thoughts as someone who has recently processed this as a believer and new doubter. I think for a long time, I was actually really terrified to sort of question God. Um, I definitely was raised in a, in a culture that that sort of said that you, you don't question God. The problem I eventually had is I realized that basically everything I knew about God um, wasn't direct knowledge. It was things that are either in scripture or things that other people had told me. And so by questioning that image of God that I had, I'm not even really questioning God. I'm questioning my perception of whether God is even real, and if he's real, what is his nature? And basically everything that I had known or thought about God came from other people. And so if God presented himself to me, and if we had a conversation like I can have with another human being, like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, if he, if he you know, revealed himself to me in that way, uh, I'd be a lot less likely to question, right? Because I'd be like, that's direct knowledge. You know, if, if, I, um, if I heard that there was some person who was saying a bunch of things, um, but I had never really met that person, I, I wouldn't be certain that that person for sure really said those things. But if that person said those things to my face, then I know, I'm like, well, yeah, I was there. This person said those things. So there's a really big difference between questioning what you've heard from other people about something else and questioning something that someone has told you to your face, a first person revelation. And, and to me, that's the crux of the issue is that I, I started to uh, question my ideas of God because I recognized that all of those ideas had come from people. And people are fundamentally flawed. And, and I, I think... Um, rife with uh, conflicting motivations and conflicting influences. And it's an incredibly, incredibly subjective thing. And uh, so I, th I think for me, this journey has been trying to get to the bottom of what is really true about reality, about existence, about, you know, the nature of God, if he exists. And, and you know, what do we even mean when we say the word God? And my perception of that has been evolving over time. But if God is so far above me that it's unfair for me to question him, then I would say he's also so far above all of us 
that you probably shouldn't be coming at me claiming that you know more about him than I do. Because if he's so far above me, then he's, he's beyond questioning, then he's also beyond understanding, including your understanding. And um, that's the mystery uh, that we're all faced with, right? And, and even Christianity would say that God is both knowable and unknowable. And when you're dealing with something that's partially knowable, and partially unknowable, it's totally reasonable to ask questions. And I would also add that the idea that we shouldn't ask questions about our beliefs is one of the most damaging ideas I can think of in any ideology. Um, that's totalitarianism. I just feel like whenever you're developing a culture where people can't ask questions, you're headed down a very, very, very dangerous road, politically, spiritually, personally, relationally. Questions Honest questions are, should always be welcomed by, by anybody that's concerned with truth. And I would say, if you're behaving in such a way that you are scared of the questions that are being leveled at you about the things that you hold to be true, that says something about your perception of truth. Because if you're, if you're holding on to something that's really true, then you know, the truth should not be afraid of questions. The truth is not afraid of questions. And so if questions are posed honestly and kindly, which is what I feel like I've been doing, then then any true believer should have no problem with that. In fact, most of my Christian friends have been very kind and respectful to me in this time where I have been questioning because they really believe that God is real and he's going to reveal, my, uh, reveal himself in this period of questioning for me. And, and to me, that, that, that shows a confidence that they, they really hold these things that they believe to be true. And um, anyone who tells me I can't question, that indicates to me that they lack that same confidence. And um, yeah, so I, I am for uh, more questions, more conversation. I, I'm for open dialogue. And anyone who tries to shut that stuff down is uh, is perpetuating a, a culture of, of shame and control that I think is um, really damaging. And that's one of the things that I'm fighting against. Very good points. Shutting down questions is about shame and control. When someone like Martin berates deconverts for disagreeing with things he claims God says, he's shutting the door to open dialogue with them and instead defaulting to an inward-focused conversation about them with other Christians. The result is a community that turns inward, refuses to engage with the outside world, and then feels marginalized because the rest of society somehow doesn't react well to being chastised for its lack of belief. But it's even worse than that. Much worse. Because when Martin tells this community that people like John just left the faith out of willful disobedience, he's doing more than trash-talking non-believers. He's making an example of them showing current believers how they will be received if they ever step out of line with current doctrine, and in fact teaching them to be ashamed of any doubts they might already be experiencing. This leads them to bottle up their innermost thoughts and live paralyzed by fear of open dialogue, not only with the outside world but with each other. This is a tragic and lonely way to live. Nobody should be afraid of their own thoughts. Nobody should be afraid that if they express what they sincerely believe, or even wonder about, that they will be looked down upon as having turned against their Heavenly Father. Conversely, nobody should foster this environment of shame in order to control others. And if you live in this kind of environment, remember, nobody gets to tell you that their teaching, their personal revelation, their interpretation of any book represents the will of God and thus demand your obedience. If you're surrounded by such people, I won't tell you to burn all your bridges with them, especially if they're family but find some place where honest questions and open dialogue are welcome. This will be vital to any true understanding you'll ever have of yourself, others, and, if you still believe he exists, God. This program was made possible by a grant from Anthony Guthrie, John Adams, S.R. Foxley, 
Bob Generic, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.